I'm really happy to see such a wonderful turnout today. This is really great. This is our second um, edition of Culinary Legacies, and so I'm really, really happy to be here today. One thing I do want to tell you about is that um, the SOFAB Culinary Library and Archive is going to open officially on October 30th. And this is a partnership with the New Orleans Public Library. It is going to be the culinary branch of the New Orleans Public Library. And it's the only standalone culinary library that we've been able to find in the United States. So we're really, really excited about this almost happening. It's just about three weeks away, so we're really excited about it. And I'm very excited to be right here with this icon of um, the city and our culinary heritage. And I think that you are all here because you know who he is. His name is Mr. Al Scramuza. And, When I was thinking about this this afternoon, I almost thought that we would come in and sing together with the bouncing ball his wonderful songs <laughs> about Seafood City. But do you all remember the address? It's 1826 North Broad. That's right. That's right. And not 25, 26. <laughs> yeah, that's too late. That's, that's the right. other one. It's a different street different street. So um, I'm not really going to uh, tell you a whole lot about this gentleman. I am going to ask him to tell us a little bit about himself. So I'm going to start by just welcoming you and saying, would you let us know a little bit about how you got started in the culinary world in New Orleans? Thank you, Beth. I know you. That's a lot. <laughs> I want to introduce my friend, my uh, companion, my sweetheart over there, Lorraine Collette. And, uh, and I see a lot of my friends in there, you know, Steve and Dave and Gary, and I don't know if my grandson's in there. Is my grandson in there, Tony? Over there? Yeah, yeah my, look at my grandson. Is this beautiful girl here with him? No. But that's my grandson, Tony, right there, Italiano. <laughs> As a third, Albert Scramuzzi the third, but we call him Tony. Yeah, this is the legacy I'm leaving for you, son. And the rest of your children, if you have any. <laughs> but um, I just want to tell you all, I'm very honored that you all, that you have selected me to come here tonight, and uh, I appreciate you all coming. Uh, I just want to tell you that I am an authentic Italian boy from New Orleans, I was born and raised in a French market. <laughs> Actually, I was born in a property uh, owned by my uncle, Uncle Skiro, Joyce and Skiro. In fact, is here tonight. He had one of the first Italian uh, ice cream parlors, like uh, uh, like ricottas. Ricottas, exactly, exactly. I think uh, I think they bought well, about the same time too in the early. Uh, 1900s, uh, 19, like 1910, 1920, something like that. Uh, it was on, uh, his place was on St. Philip, and uh, actually it wasn't in the French Quarter, St. Philip and Robinson. And uh, in fact, I usually passed there. I took a few pictures of it lately. I just, uh, I'm in love with that, that place. That's, I was born upstairs from the ice cream bowl. And uh, Joyce's, Joyce's father used to make the ice cream about five o'clock in the morning. He used to get in there when he'd get through uh, churning the ice cream, they had these round cylinders, put the ice cream in, and then he'd, he'd bag them, up, up, cup them up, and put them in the little containers, and whatever was left in those cylinders, I'd just pass my hand and just, it'd be all on my arm, I'd be licking my arms. I was about five years old, I remember that very distinctly. Uh, then after that, we, we moved to the, uh, we, that, that's when we authentically, authentically became a, uh, French market, I don't know what you call it, so hoodlum. Because in the French market, we learned how to do everything. I can remember that uh, it was during depression. I, I, was, I was a depression baby. I was born in 1927. I'm almost 100 years old, guys. Oh, do I look like I'm 60? 
I tell my kids that I'm 60. I coach. I still coach. I'm active in coaching. I tell them I'm 60. And they say, Coach, you that old? I say, yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> if, they, if they only knew. But anyhow, a little bit about uh, the French market. I, I could remember as a very small child. My background, my background is actually produce. I was telling Beth earlier, my, my grandfather, my daddy's father, ran a plantation. He was the overseer of a plantation called Stanton Plantation, which today is a part of English Turn in Algiers. And English Turn and a lot more of that area, this plantation existed. It was like uh, thousands of acres. And, uh, there were uh, like, uh, of course, Joycelyn might have a little information on the Italian part of it, but one, si one, one side of the plantation was Italian families, about 250, and the other side about 250 uh, slaves. At the time, slaves were legal. And uh, my grandfather ran the plantation. They grew every kind of edible food that you can think of. It was thousands and thousands of acres. It raised a lot of horses, pigs, chickens, whatever. And my, my dad was born in that environment. So my dad, uh, it was in his blood uh, when he uh, left the plantation and came over to New Orleans. He, uh, he got involved in the French market. And he uh, was really a, a, produ a produce man. In fact, when I was a teenager, I could remember going to high school that my daddy told me, son, you can't go to football practice. You got to come over here. I just bought a whole truckload of oranges. They would go with their, they would go with their vehicles. Their trucks were like just sided, boarded up, straight sides, maybe about four or five feet high. Just the, the, the orchard pickers would, uh, on the plantation, they, they grew everything. They grew, they had, they had uh, acres and acres of pecan grooves and, and orange grooves and all kinds. They grew everything on this plantation. They would come, the, the uh, harvesters would come with big baskets and they'd just throw them in there, you know, in a, in a truck. And maybe the truck would have maybe about uh, 2,000 pounds of oranges. Mm -hmm. And on Sundays, and Saturdays, when our team would be playing sometimes, he would tell me, you can't go play. I said, well, they have my uniform, they were souping up, I'm going to play that. So said, you got to come and grade these oranges. And we would, we would grade them in three sizes and put them in these big hampers and that. And, you know, it was in the French market. I could remember my dad had oranges, he had, he had peddling wagons, he used to sell, uh, he, uh, he had horses and mules, he had maybe six or seven peddling wagons. And that's, that's how he met my mother. Because on St. Philip, Philip Street, where I was born, uh, Joyce's mother is my first cousin. Joyce's mother and my mother were sisters. And so my daddy met my mother through their, his, his stepbrothers, the uh, Skiros. And then Joyce can give you some information on that. You might have a little information on it. But anyway, they were familiar. They were, they were, they were involved in uh, also in Stanton Plantation. They were involved in uh, horses and mules, and they supplied a lot of the horses and mules during the uh, during, during the World War One. And uh, to get on with the culinary the foods and that, the French market is where I came up as a small child. And I can remember we were very poor because my dad and my mother were separated, although, you know, he was doing that. I think he had the first really poor boy shop in the French quarters. I mean, uh, he's probably the first one to start off with poor boys in 1912, 13, sometime during the World War. He was in his 20s or 30s, and he had a little, he had a little poor boy stand on, uh, it was on, Charters, I think. No, it was on, I think it was on Charters. It was Papa Jim's Poor Boys. You can still see it on the wall there. Kind of faded out. He used to sell a Poor Boy sandwich with 24 oysters and a whole loaf of bread. Just cut the ends off for 20 cents. <laughs> and that was like in the 1920s. I was born in 1927. And I'm very familiar with the seafood part of it because he used to have, uh, he used to have, some of the people in our family shucking oysters all day long. 
It was 24 oysters on a sandwich for 20 cents. You know, you had to shuck a lot of oysters. <laughs> and uh, my background is really, you know, being around food and produce, et cetera, et cetera. It was in my blood. So to move on after that, you know, it was moving up a little bit. I was, uh, got into the service. I served in the service in World War II. Got out in 1946, then wound up uh, doing a few things. And, but always around that business, I married in 1949. 19, no, not 1940, 1949, yeah. And I could remember I was selling shoes at the time at Sanders Shoe Store on Cross Street from Jesuit Church. And I could remember that. My brother told me, he says, you know, I have an opportunity to run a little fruit stand, a little, a little produce department in, this, in a little market here on Calliope and Camp right now. The bridge runs over it. And uh, the man lets me wants to give me this thing free of free of rent. All I have to do is put the produce in that because they, they didn't want to fool with produce. And now that we had the background of it, I decided to say, yeah, I quit the, I quit the shoes. And I said, well, we're going to do that. And uh, I went in there. I had actually $400 cash. That was my a lot dad, of money. Yeah, and my daddy gave me a truck, a little truck. And I had some lumber, and I built the fruit stand and all, and I put it in there, and $400 that I had, put a down payment on a little refriger refrigerated case to where we put the lettuce and the fresh stuff that needed to be refrigerated. And my brother and I were partners, and I could remember we used to go to the French market every morning at 5 o'clock and get the produce to bring over there. And we used to make our lists out say one case of oranges, one case of lemons, two sacks of potatoes, and et cetera, et cetera. I would come back with five cases of oranges, 10 cases of what is, always five times as much as what we had on the list. And he used to get on my butt, what are you doing? I says, man, if you don't have it, you can't force yourself to sell it. And I always did believe in overbuying. So I had this little place on, on Cali Open Camp, and then it, it was a nice little fruit stand, and it started to flourish. Then I started, I built a little uh, oyster counter and started shucking oysters, and I brought in a few little shrimp, like on a Friday, and it, crabs, and uh, they started selling real good. And the place, I mean, I had started crowding the grocery store so, so much material that I, that I was selling that there was no more room to work there. So. Uh, I expanded to another fruit stand on Drys and Jackson, and a man was selling chickens, and he had a, a, a butcher shop. He said, I'll let you put a fruit stand there for nothing because you're nothing but a, a, a public draw. You draw, draw the people in with the fruit stand. And the personality there wasn't bad, so I'm, I'm a brag of it. It was okay. <laughs> and we used to sell the fresh mustards, uh, uh, mustard, uh, Mustard greens and turnip greens, put the ice on them, and we'd sell 50,000, 50 dozen. And you were always yeah. buying all of your and produce. And I, was at going, the I would market. go every morning to the French market okay. and get my produce. The farmers used to come in authentically. Everything was fresh. It was brought in from all over the southern part of Louisiana to the French market. That was the days when people really ate the good, fresh, nourishing foods, you know, directly from. from from the origin where they grew, grew them and everything. And I, I can remember that uh, after being in there, opened another fruit stand on, on, uh, on dryads. So I had three fruit stands going, and my uncle comes to me and he says, uh, Uncle Dominic Scamuse, they had dump trucks, you might remember him. Uh, he says, uh, you know, Al, he says, you, you know, you ought, to, you ought to move down to a better area. There's more people. There's more people, and there's a better chance for you. I know a place on Broaden Broad by a road that the uh, man's looking for somebody to come in there, Terra Nova's meat market. He wants to give you a free spot, you know, because in those days, if you can really draw the people in, and nobody liked the food with the produce. Anybody that had a grocery store or a meat market or something, did not want to fool with the produce because there's a lot of work. You've got to be willing to work hard if you're going to fool with produce. 
So I accepted. I went in there, no rent. And he gave me a nice, place, nice space in there, you know, and started increasing every week, every week, every week. And first thing you know, I had so much produce in there that he says, you're forcing me out of my own place. I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Eventually, you know, he's, he, he was in the business long enough, you know, that where he, he was well, you know, fixed, and he wasn't worried about any more money. He was really making, making the money he really needed necessarily to uh, retire. He says, look, he says, since you, are so, you have so much, so much to do with all of this product, I'll lease this whole store to you, and I leased it from him. Mm -hmm. And I took over the whole store in 1950. Broad and Bayou Road. It still exists, Broadview Seafoods. Mm -hmm. That's where I actually started out on Broad. A lot of people don't know. I didn't go to Broad in St. Bernard until 1960. <coughs> well, accidentally, a, a guy, a young Cajun, comes over there one day, and I was a guy that always believed in buying stuff by the truckload. I'd go around the French market, and if a guy was around there, say, uh, every day for a week, and he had a tractor, trailer load of uh, maybe watermelons, maybe a thousand watermelons, and I could see the guy sleeping. He hadn't sold anything, you know, he got about three fourths of his watermelons left. I would offer, offer him a blanket price, take the whole load, and drive the tractor trailer down the broad by your road, and put the watermelons all the way on the sidewalk, all the way occupy the whole block. And people used to say, what, are you crazy? I said, yeah. <laughs> well, they're going to steal these watermelons. I said, yeah, they are. They're going to break them. I said, yeah, they are. I said, what the hell? I bought the whole load. It cost me maybe 15 cents a piece. You know, and I sold them for 35, big profit. So what the hell? If they stole two or three, I didn't care. If they broke three or four, I didn't care. But it drew people. It was crazy. A guy once wrote on my float, because I'm one of the organizers, one of the original people that helped organize in Demian. There were three of us. I'll go about that in another time. And uh, we, always, we always did attract, you know, people, what, whatever we did, if we did it in, in a multiple manner. And I, uh, I managed to always go to the French market at the right time, early in the morning, and I'd always understand who was in the market and how many days they were there to keep a list of it. This guy had cauliflower and he's been there six days and he's got three fourths of his cauliflowers left. Then I'd offer him, I'd say, hey man, I'd take the whole load. How much you want to give me for it? I'd, I'd, give, you a, I'd give you a whole, I'd take the whole load for $300. Say, so okay, and they drive the truck down there and I'd, I'd load them on my truck and I'd, I'd put signs up, you know, cauliflower, three for a dollar. You know, and I sell a whole truckload in two days. Well, this Cajun guy happened to come by one day. I was, had this beautiful, horrendous, it was, it was about 80 feet along the sidewalk. It was a humongous fruit, fruit stand. It was, it was big. And he said, uh, he parked his little pickup truck there, and he had about 40 sacks of crawfish on it in 1950. Well, I knew about crawfish because, you know, the people that knew about crawfish in New Orleans, this many. About one half percent knew about crawfish. But I knew about crawfish, you know why? Because when I was a kid, I lived in poverty and poor people knew about crawfish. They used to go down to me and shot, catch crawfish in the neighborhood and they'd boil them and give them out to people. And we loved it because we were hungry. And I knew about crawfish. So this guy says, uh, I said, you got 40 sacks of crawfish? I says, La. I says, I'll tell you what. How much are these? He says, well, they're 10 cents a pound. It's about $4 a sack. I said, look, I'll give you a dollar sack. I'll take the whole truckload. He says, are you crazy? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, how about $2? I'll give you $2 a sack. Are you crazy? I said, no. You're crazy. He says, I'll tell you what you do. You go ahead and take 10 sacks. Don't give me nothing. See if you sell them. It happened to be a Friday, which is a real, on, in, in those days, everybody ate no meat in New Orleans. So I says, I took the 10 sacks and I got two young kids, you know, and I, I, I got them with a fishing pole and I tied a crawfish on a string and, and I made one stand on one side of Neutrogon <laughs> abroad. Yeah. And the crawfish hanging on a string like that, 
And the people would pass by and say, what is that? What is that? And the little boy says, crawfish over there in Broad, Broad by your road, go over there. And on both sides, and man, the people were, you know how we are very, very, when we see something new, we're very interested and we get, you know, we, we inquire. So these cars were coming from every direction. Do you know I sold those 10 sacks in that one day? Wow. And that one day I was, I, I was selling like five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds. They didn't know how to cook them. People were not, people were inquisitive. They'd buy them and they didn't even know how to cook them. <laughs> but they bought them. So man, I sold those 10 sacks in that one day and I said, gee, what an idea. Well, my head starts spinning because that, that was the type of businessman I was. I call a guy up. I says, well, man. I says, tomorrow's Saturday. I don't know how good of a day it is, but can you bring me 10 or 20 sacks tomorrow? He says, we don't fish on Saturdays. I said, well, how about Sunday? Says, we don't fish on Sunday. I said, how about Monday? He said, Monday's a slow day. He says, I don't know. <laughs> so I said, well, all right. Whenever you get some more, bring them to me. So I started getting these crawfish from these guys. So eventually, the guy was bringing me like 40 sacks every time he'd come. I'd take almost a whole truckload. Was that once or twice a week? Or? No, no, from like Tuesdays on. Oh, Tuesday, okay. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They wouldn't fish on Saturdays and Sundays. So this guy was selling me these crawfish like for 10 cents a pound. I said, man, I, said, I need more crawfish than this. I said, let me see what I can do. So one morning, I followed this guy in my car. <laughs> and he went to Bayou Pigeon. It was about 5.30 in the morning. And I got over there about, about 6 or 7 o'clock. It's not that far. Maybe about 7.30. I don't know. And he goes to this ballroom. And uh, the guy, I can remember the guy's name. His name was Berthevon. He had this ballroom. So uh, I watched him, you know, and then I left, and I went down the road along the bayou, and I saw this old man on, on the ramp, and I stopped, and I says, hey, hey, uh, partner, I says, well, I said, uh, that, that place down there, that ballroom down there, I says, uh, he buys crawfish? I said, yeah, that's, that's my nephew, Felix Bertola. I said, oh, okay, cousin. I said, uh, what he does? He said, well, he sells them to the guy, I said, uh, he said, I uh, sell them to the guy, he sells them to the guy for three cents a pound, or five cents a pound, I'm not sure. And the guy was selling them to me for 10 cents a pound, he was making 100% profit. So I said, well, how much a pound does he give the fisherman? He said, two cents a pound. I said, well, you fish for him? He said, yeah. I said, well, what about if I give you three cents a pound? He said, you give me three cents a pound? I said, yes, sir. I said, do you have any cousins, any, any relatives that want to fish for me? I, you're buying for two cents a pound, and you make one cent, I give, I give it to you. I said, okay. So I started getting all the fishermen. <laughs> well, I wind up taking all the fishermen. I told the guy, the guy was selling, I said, see you later. I was buying the crawfish <laughs> for three cents a pound. He was selling the crawfish for 10 cents a pound. I ran a sale. In the newspaper, the Times Pick You an item, live crawfish, five cents a pound by the sack. And I put that guy completely out of business because he was, he was, he was paying five cents a pound for him. So I was always a volume man, you know, and, and that's where the crawfish in New Orleans. That's where they were born. That's, that's where we were introduced. And so when, about when was that? That was 1950. Okay. And what happened is I started buying advertisement on, on Times Picayune item, and WDSU was just starting out with television. Uh, WWL didn't exist in that time. I think we had only, only WDSU mm -hmm. TV, and I ran a few ads with that, and it, they were going really good. And then from that point on, I had to start, I had to start a, a rigorous campaign of teaching the public how to eat crawfish, how to cook them, how to season them, how to peel them, everything there is to do with crawfish. I used to go to different, I used to go to anywhere they would invite me to go to introduce me 
and me to introduce crawfish to the public and tell them about crawfish, I would accept, like I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, I, then I got to be doing some uh, with Andrea, what was her name? Andrea, Andrea, Andrea Hill, yeah. Started doing some uh, cook shows at every morning at about 6 o'clock. Every morning I would cook the crawfish and show them from act one all the way to the end, you know, purging them, seasoning them, how to peel them, everything. So it was a regular teaching thing for about five years. People in New Orleans did not know much about eating or getting or buying crawfish. And the nutritional advantage that crawfish have, you'd be surprised at how much nutrition they have in crawfish. And uh, that is where really the crawfish business really uh, was born in New Orleans. And, uh, when, gonna... uh, when they started to actually um, farm crawfish a lot, did that affect your business? Well, all right, let me explain this to you. That from the inception, from the first year, 1950, in, 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 in the areas where I got crawfish, 90 Five percent of the crawfish I bought was actually the large crawfish that came out the spillway. Mm -hmm. A very small percentage, maybe five percent of the crawfish, were from crawfish farms. Crawfish farms were just—they were just starting with that. Uh, it came actually from—it came from the from the east. Mm -hmm. It came—it came from uh, I think Oriental people had them in the rice fields over there, and they came over here and taught us to do that. But uh, it was very, very, very small amount of farms at the time. And I could remember that my ex-wife and I would be passing through a lot of areas where there are no, nothing but crawfish farms. And I used to tell her, you see all these fields? I said, you see all this sugar cane and all, all this stuff they grow on these beans and all? They're all going to become, that's, they're going to be nothing but crawfish farms because the acreage pr production of crawfish are like, 10 to 1 against any kind of vegetation that they, they grow and sell. So, I mean, why would, you, why would you grow something that brings you $5 when you can grow something that same amount of weight can bring you $25? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, crawfish just pushed a lot of these other producers out of business. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there, there's where the crawfish business was really... Uh, the inception of it, and it, it succeeded from that point on. And, uh, and so how did you become the, the doctor? Well, I decided to do that in 19... Uh, oh, incidentally, I started advertising on TV in 1951. Uh, I think 1951 or 52, when, WW, when did WWL start? Steve, when did they start? Do you know? What time? 52? Two? Mm -hmm. What did he say? 52, yes. It was 1952. I did my first commercial there with, with them with crawfish. I was the champ. I remember that one very distinctly. I'm not, I don't, we don't have time to go through it. But anyway, <laughs> it was a real good commercial. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I believe in really, uh, I was telling someone the other day, you know, you need to sell yourself first before you can sell your product. So I just I hit on selling Al Scramuza as well as the name of the product. And I think, you know, that's, that's the reason why, you know, today people know who I am because I sold it, you know. And, and I truly believe, I was telling Steve the other day, you know, if anyone in here wants to get fa famous and don't have any money, really wants people to know them, just buy you some big old signs on the highway and just put your name out there on it. Spend all the money you have. You have $100,000, spend it on those signs and just put your name on it. And people start asking other people, who's that person? Who's that person? It's just a name. I don't know. Who's that person? Everywhere I go, I see that person, Joe Brown, Joe Brown, Joe Brown. Who's Joe Brown? Everywhere I go, Joe Brown's over here, over there. Well, Joe Brown, who's Joe Brown? Eventually, you know, people become more inquisitive, and that's how people can get famous. Does that make sense? So, <laughs> so, so tell us about becoming the doctor. Huh? I decided to do a thing, you know, I just thought of it off the head of my, you know, I, you know, I just think I, 
I should do a thing uh, that uh, would be funny and that would sell. And it's stupid. And it was stupid, funny, and did sell. And I uh, just thought about it, you know. I wanted, I wanted to actually explain to the public what you need to do with crawfish. Because a lot of people didn't know how to clean crawfish, how to purge them. So I go through the process of every crawfish that we used to boil. We had a, we had a, a long table, about eight, eight feet long, stainless steel table. We'd have on both sides the platform. We'd dump the crawfish on the table, take all the dead ones out, and the other ones would slide down into the water and we'd purge them. Mm -hmm. And the emphasis was put on that we boil our crawfish and we're very particular about boiling only live ones. We make sure we clean them real well, purge them, and make sure they're real clean when they go into the pot. So the gist of the advertisement was, you know, I mean, this one, no good, cardiac arrest. <laughs> this one here, needs to brush his teeth. Put the tetrascope on his chest, Cardiac arrest. <laughs> and the people got the idea. It was funny, you know, and it was corny, but it sold, you know. Our crawfish, we were excellent with the cleanliness of our crawfish and the taste. And when did you start actually selling them already cooked? Oh, I started from, well, I'll tell you at the beginning. I'm glad you brought that up. At the beginning, in 1950, the first year, I only sold live crawfish. I sold live crawfish to the public and then I introduced them to the restaurants. And I used to go out to the, like Fitzgerald's in the old days, they had Fitzgerald's, Brunings, and all those places on the lakefront, you know. And uh, I can't remember all the names, but anyway, I used to make my rounds around there, you know. I used to sell, I used to sell the, the live crawfish to them. So what happened was I got to a point one day that I could not sell all the crawfish. And my brother and I were in partners at the time. said, we got to do something with the crawfish. If we got too many, we don't want to stop our fishermen because we don't want to lose them. So why don't we do this? Let's go ahead and sell all the live ones we can and let's boil the rest and see if we can sell them boiled. So I went to the junkyard and I bought four hot water heaters, the big ones, and I got the burners out of them. And I used those burners with little bricks and I, I hooked gas up to the four of them and I got four number three tubs. <laughs> and I had to take and I had to cure that, I had to cure those tubs and the way I would do it is with salt and vinegar. You'd have to boil it, you know, to cure the uh, galvanize out of the tubs. I would cure the tubs and, 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 and boil the crawfish. Well, I started boiling the crawfish that we had left over, you know, the ones that we didn't sell. And I, I put signs up all over the place, four pounds for a dollar boiled crawfish. And they really took off with that, they really took off with that. So the boiled crawfish became more of a demand than the live crawfish. So we had to balance it out and go from four pounds for a dollar to three pounds for a dollar. And if we couldn't sell the boiled ones, I mean, if we had we had the boiled ones, and we had you know, uh, we didn't have enough to boil. We wouldn't we wouldn't be able to deliver you the live ones. So the boiled crawfish kind of took precedent for a while, and it balanced off, you know. And uh, business is business, you, you know. You do whatever you got to do, but that was the inception of boiled crawfish. And from that point, you know, we started boiling shrimp, then crabs, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, so when did you name it Seafood City? When well, all right. When I started out in 1950, it was Broadview Seafoods on Broad and Bayou Road. And I decided, you see, through the years, I, I, I built a big wharf in Wyclosky. I used to buy like a thousand hampers of crab a week. Mm -hmm. I used to buy like a hundred barrels of shrimp a day. I built a big wharf in Wyclosky. And I had a big, big wholesale business going because I, I used to supply all the circle food, the circle food store, all the Schwagman food stores, I used to supply them all. I just sent trucks out, one big truck out to all the stores every morning. All, all, and all, they had uh, 
And did you have fin fish too, or just? Uh, no, just we we saw we had speckled trout because they had the wharf. So I used to buy the speckled trout. I used to buy the speckled trout, the redfish, and the catfish. Mm -hmm. Used to buy the soft crabs. I used to buy two hundred dozen soft crabs every day. I had a big wholesale business going as well as a big. I I used to sell as much as one hundred seventy-five thousand pounds of crawfish in a week. That was a lot of crawfish. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I can remember I clocked one day in my store selling 50,000 pounds on a Saturday. Because the, the, the trucks used to pull in the back. They had a big, big backyard fenced in. And we used the trucks used to pull in from all over southern Louisiana and buy crawfish for me. Because I, I was the biggest one because I was the originator. They would come all from everywhere to buy crawfish for me. So it, it really grew into a real, real uh, conglomerate. And we had uh, people coming from all over the country doing, doing national stories on us, you know, and... Uh, and so did you was, sell outside of the New Orleans area? Yeah, okay. yeah, people used, to, you, people used to come from like Alabama, Mississippi and that, and, uh, and, and, and they'd come in and we'd load them up, you know. And, and I, did you ship out, out of? Well, uh, I shipped out. I, I stopped doing that because people would just take advantage of it, especially with the crabs. Started shipping the good, uh, good late crabs out to uh, different parts of the uh, northern part of uh, this country, in uh, Baltimore. And, uh, and I had a guy from uh, three, uh, three Rivers, uh, what is it, Ohio, whatever. And I got tired of it because, I mean, they, they, would, they would get your product when their season was off, and then when their season was on, they'd just stop, mm -hmm. and they'd keep you holding the bag. So I told them I didn't want, I just canceled out on all of them. The last guy I did business was, was from Three Rivers somewhere in Ohio, I don't, Three Rivers, Ohio, I don't know where it is. And uh, the guy, and, I had this crab, I had a lot of crab fishermen who used to bring crabs into my store. I had this one fisherman that brought me some crabs, and he found a little, a lagoon or something, and he brought me crabs that weighed like about a pound and a half each, they were that big. They were like lobsters. And he says, they're crabs, they're not lobsters. And I could not believe these, they had a, a cost span of about 24 inches, they were big. And this guy from Three Rivers, uh, I told him, I said, man, I said, I got some crabs. I said, not many. I said, they're big as lobsters. So I sent them to him. The guy went crazy. He got famous up there because of these crabs. And he quit me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, business is business. What can I say? <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, uh, I've been retired since 1994, you know, and I've, I've really been... God has been good to me. My Heavenly Father's really taking good care of me. And uh, I had 20 years of really good retirement. And then uh, someone came to me that's sitting in this room, said, well, why don't you go ahead and sell yourself? You, you still got some zest in you. I said, okay. So uh, as a result, I, uh, I came back on TV again last, uh, last month. The Saints game, uh, I was on TV. Some of you all saw it, right? Bromont. Bromont, yeah. Y'all, some of y'all saw it. Well, incidentally, we're going to do it again on the 10th of uh, November. It's going to be on the Saints game at home here. W, w, WDSU, it, it'll be on again. So look for it, guys. And, uh, and so has that been fun? It's funny, yeah, it's fun. It's not hard work. I can't, I don't want to work hard. I, I really, <laughs> I really have paid my dues. People ask me, oh, why are you closed down? Why are you closed down your business? I said, Shh. after 45 years, I deserve the rest. And that was 45 years, that was 45 years, add 20 years of retirement on, so that's 55, 65 years. So actually, you know, I sit back and realize that it's been over 65 years since I've been doing this. Lord. And they say, I always you. I says, I'm as old as time. <laughs> but I feel good. God is good to me. You know, I, I have this longevity because uh, I try to take care of myself. I wake out as much as I can. I try to swim a lot. I still coach. I'm active in coaching. In fact, Scott, 
what's his name, Scott Walker from, uh, is he here tonight? We told him that we we're going to do this thing. Steve, are you here? Steve's here? No. He was here. I don't know what happened to him. Disappeared. But anyhow, uh, anyhow, so that's about it, folks. I don't know what else I can say, but I can say a lot more. But we don't have that much we're time. I don't believe. Take some questions though, from sure. the audience. Yes. What's that? A few old commercials. Uh, how about doing the jingle? The jingle, that'd be. Want to do the jingle? Yeah. Can y'all do it with me? Yeah. All right. Seafood City is a very pretty down on Broad and Saint Bernard. Stay with Oscar Musa and you'll never be a loser. 1826 North Broad, Seafood City, very pretty. Seafood City, very pretty. Y'all keep on. Seafood City, very pretty. Y'all keep on. Yeah, y'all keep on. <laughs> and that's the background. Steve, I'm looking for you, bro. My question refers to when you first start, the first time you, you boil the seafood, how did you know how to cook it and did you use spices? Did you put everything we put in it now? How did you know how to do that? Well, I'll tell you what, we had, when I was a kid, and we used to get those crawfish from the people who used to go down to... Uh, Pierport. No, they didn't go down to Pierport, they went down to... Uh, no, 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 no. Um, I said it earlier, anyhow. Weishaus, the spillway? Man Shack. Thank you. They used to go down to Man Shack, catch six, seven sacks. I'd watch them boil them. Some of the people from out of those areas knew how to boil them. They came down to the shores. I can remember as a small kid, nine years old, how they used to boil them, what they used to put in them, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's the way I learned how to boil them. Whenever they had some crawfish, and we could get some from them, we would boil them. And we, would, we, we learned by doing it. So we did it very often when it was crawfish season. We'd get maybe four, five, six times, or seven times sometimes uh, during the crawfish season, get the crawfish from the people who go out and catch them. And a group of people would go out, maybe four or five guys would go out and catch maybe between them about 15, 20 sacks of crawfish. So they could eat all them crawfish, they'd give them out to the neighbors. Well, you know, that's, that's the way it used to be in the old days. In the old days, it was a lot different than what it is now, you know what I mean? If you cooked a big pot of red beans, you know, and you saw your neighbor over the fence, you'd say, hey, baby, how you doing today? I cooked some red beans. Here, you give your neighbor over the fence a nice big plate of red beans. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Huh? That don't happen no more but it used to happen very frequently. Same thing with the crawfish. That used to happen with the crawfish. We used to, we used to boil them with the cayenne pepper, the lemons, the onion, the salt, the garlic. When I was a kid, I can remember that. So I knew, I knew how to boil crawfish. I knew how they, boil, how they boiled them. And then when I became a teenager, we used to get them, my dad and I used to get them and bring them around. We used to cook them a lot then. But they didn't cook them in Louisiana. We still would get them from people that would go out and catch them. Hey, Joe Blow's going out and catch crawfish tomorrow. He's going out to Gentilly, down in old Gentilly, they used to catch crawfish. Right now, right there, right there past Franklin Avenue. You go past Franklin Avenue about four, five, six blocks, they used to catch crawfish in that area, believe it or not. So uh, that, I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, we have a question back there. Hi, hi, Al. How you doing? Well, yeah. Oh, right here, Dolph. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, did they always put potatoes and corn in the in the crawfish boil? Well, what it was, what what happened was, uh, <laughs> through the years, as I was boiling crawfish in the fifties, I started adding. Well, I'm going to boil corn and see if it sells. And I'd put the corn in there, and I'd boil it, and I'd put it there, and I'd sell the corn, whatever it is, like maybe 
10 cents a head at the time or whatever cooked. And we saw it real good. Then we tried the sausage. Used to use a double D sausage. We used to sell a sausage separate. Then the potatoes. And then it, everything caught on. You see? Now people boil crawfish, they put everything in them. They put lemon, they put oranges, they put cannibal, they put everything in there. Anything that, believe me, people, I, I've never seen people put so much stuff in crawfish. It's one, one food that you can just never overdo. You can put whatever you want in it. I don't care what it is. And uh, when, when, whenever I boil crawfish, I, put, I generally put the corn, the sausage, the potatoes, you know? And uh, basically, that's what I do. I bought some crawfish a couple times this year. Bought them for my little base, ba uh, basketball team twice. I bought them for a group that I belong to, and about maybe five times this year. But I just do it occasionally. It's, it's hard work, but I love it. <laughs> so we have a question over here. Did you uh, make your own seasoning up after a while? Yeah, I made my own seasoning, and that, I'm glad you brought that up, Lorraine, because I made my own seasoning, and I, I had a seasoning that was so authentic and so good. I hate to brag, but I love to brag, it was because it was good. <laughs> and uh, it was like 18 different ingredients, and I had a gentleman that used to grind it and put it together for me, and used to bag it in like 40-pound uh, plastic bags and put it into boxes. Used to, used to get like 3,000 pounds of ground at the time. And that, that season, nobody could duplicate it. I had such a, such a different flavor in my crawfish that people cannot, could not duplicate it. And I have many, 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 many people that confront me about it. I cannot find crawfish that have the same aroma and taste that your crawfish had. I hate to brag, but I love to brag, too. Uh, it, it, it was really something completely different. So uh, that, that was one of the things that, you know, uh, people talk about still today. In fact, I might put my seasoning out on the market because I don't have to worry. I don't have to. Who, who would like to buy it if I put it on the market? Raise your hand. I think it would be a hit, huh, wouldn't it? Okay, we, we might try it. We might try it. Oh, yeah. I put my picture on it. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. With the wave. Yeah. <laughs> we have a question. Do, do you remember uh, a Times Picayune columnist named Howard Jacobs? Yeah, Howard Jacobs. I remember Howard. Do you remember some of, the, some of the titles that he bestowed upon you? Well, I don't remember that, but I do remember him. He Can I refresh friend. your memory? Huh? Can I refresh your memory? Yes, you can. Well, first he called you the seafood king. Then the next year when he asked you about crawfish, he might have called you uh, the Maharaja of crawfish. The, ma the Maharaja, yes, sir. Well, but wait, it gets better. It gets better. Uh, then he started calling you the Nabob of Crawdadia. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> well, I I've been reading about you. And then this one I had to look up. He called you the Gaekwar of Crawdadia. Now, a Gaekwar is a leader of some little province in India, but I looked it up and he called you the Gaekwar of Crawdadia. So I think that's some nice titles. <laughs> yeah. Talk about a very, very, very good friend, Howard Jacobs. I don't, when, when did he pass? Uh, I don't know. I've just been following but, his column. And but Howard used to write about me a lot. I mean, we talked just about every day. I mean, he was a great guy. He did a, he did a lot for me. But uh, he helped me a lot to, uh, to put this thing forward, you know, to, to educate the, the public about crawfish. He, he had a, played a big part, big part. So we're going to uh, wrap this up. So sure. I think... Uh, We've, we've had a fabulous time, right? Yes. Can you stay for a few minutes and talk yeah. to people? Okay. I want to thank Beth. I want to thank Beth and every one of you all for being here tonight, taking your time out to come listen to me babble, but uh, it is what it is. <laughs> thank you. It's definitely worth the time, for sure. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming, and we'll see you next time. Kit Wool is going to be here, so. <laughs>
It'll be a great time too. Thank you yes. so much. Good, this is thank great. you. Well, thank every one of you all.